Hey guys, so this is my first process video where I show you how I went about composing something. If you're new to my channel, I teach music theory focused on contemporary Japanese music. Recently, I collaborated with another YouTuber named Gami and we made a song together. He's also into anime and video game music and makes some pretty cool beats inspired by those genres. Go check his channel out if you haven't already. Today we each released a new video on our channels and he's going to talk about the production side of the song that we made together and I'm going to talk about the music theory side of the song that we made together. And that's because I recorded the main sample or the core musical idea for the loop. And Gami did all the beat making and production to make it into a full song. I sort of took on the role of a piano player who would eventually get sampled by New Jabez or somebody like that, uh, with the slight difference that I know who's going to sample it and I know how he's going to use it. For making this piano loop, I decided to try out a couple things that I learned from studying Joe Hisaishi's music over the past two years. Hisaishi has scored many Studio Ghibli films that you've probably seen, like Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, and his style is iconic, to say the least. He's probably the Japanese composer that I've studied the most. I'll be referring to some music theory concepts along the way, but don't worry if you don't understand or are curious to learn more. I'll link to the videos where I talk about these concepts in more detail in the description, and then I'll put little annotations uh, somewhere around here to help direct you to the right video to learn about what you're curious about or what you don't understand. The main two things I'll talk about today are harmony and melody. Harmony and chord progressions are really important for me when I'm composing. For this song, what I first decided to do was to use two chord progressions that are commonly found in contemporary Japanese music. So the first one is four, five, six. And the second one is four, five, three, six. Four, five, three, six is so common, in fact, that Japanese musicians often refer to it as the Odo Shinko, uh, which means the royal road progression, or really what that translates to is like the classic progression. It's essentially like walking a really well-traveled path like the road that would be built by the emperor's government. It's in possibly hundreds of anime openings, and I actually covered it in my most popular video called Common Core Progressions in Japanese Music. But anyway, starting from the ideas of using 456 and using the royal road progression and putting it in G major, this is what I had. Okay, so that's just a start, right? So in the context where I'm studying him in these Studio Ghibli films, Hisaishi is really composing for children's films, and that has certain musical consequences. One of them is that it's probably a good idea to have it be very clear what key your song is in. Nothing super experimental or wandering. And because of that, Hisaishi really likes to make use of what are called cadences. A cadence is like a musical period in that it clearly marks the ending of a phrase or sometimes even the end of a song and establishes the key that that song is in very clearly. The simplest one is 5-1, which is kind of just to say, I'm done, and the song's in G, and we can move on now. And the next most common is a 2-5-1, which is more like, I am done, and by the way, the song was in G the whole time. So essentially, my next step in writing this progression was to add cadences at the end of each phrase. The first one after 456, and the second one after 4536. And the result was something like this. So of those two cadences, the first one is a resolved 251, so to speak, because we actually go two, five, and we resolve to G, we resolve to the one. The second time we have a two, five, it's unresolved because we have A minor going to D, 
and then the progression wraps back around on C, on the four chord. This was an intentional choice because this unresolved cadence kind of hints at there being a little bit more and it makes it more conducive to being a loop. And the way that you can resolve this song quite easily is just to resolve the last unresolved 2-5. So we hold out A minor, then D, and we're done. I am done, and the song is over, and it's in G. So what I did next was to upgrade the last two chords of the song to be a bit more interesting and colorful. And specifically, this five chord, this D, um, if fully extended as a D dominant, would be voiced like that. And I find this standard voicing of a D dominant a little old-timey and a little hokey. And one voicing that I like a lot better is this sort of sus voicing of a D dominant, and that is specifically this uh, C over D voicing, it's called, because we have a C chord plus a D under it. Or what I used here specifically was C major 7 over D. Pretty cool. I, I really like this. So this is the last chord that I finished the song on. Um, and technically this would be D sus 13 or something like that, but a more specific thing to say is that it's a C major 7 over D. In the songs I've studied of his, Hisaishi really likes to use these sus voicings for dominant chords, like C over D or C major 7 over D, um, because they have this kind of floaty feel to them that's really nice. I would argue that he probably originally got the idea from impressionists like Debussy. And the first sort of spicier harmonic choice that I made was taking the A minor and making it an A dominant. And you'll notice that this introduces a note that's outside of G major. It introduces a C sharp. So this is a chord that's outside the key, and it's called a secondary dominant. The secondary part meaning that it belongs to some other key than the key that we're really in. And really how that's working is that it's the five chord of the five chord that would then lead to one. And again, because I don't like the standard voicing for A7, I made it G major 7 over A, that same voicing uh, that we use for the following chord to then lead to G major 7. So let's hear the whole thing as it was at that point. Then a final thing that I did was to add a couple more advanced voice leading chords to give the whole song a greater sense of tension and release. I won't belabor the theory of it too much, but essentially I led into a C using B7 into a C. And I led into our A dominant with a B flat major seven. So it was like, Uh, which is basically just a very nearby chord that leads well into this G major 7 over A. The harmony part of my process is definitely the most involved from the music theory perspective, so no worries if you didn't understand everything I talked about just now. If any of it was confusing for you or perhaps inspiring for you and you want to learn more, please go to the description to find links to relevant videos that can teach you more. The final product is a little difficult for me to play in sequence, but let's try it.
Something like that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Cool, so now we can do the fun part about melody. Essentially what I did once I had those chords down was that I would come up with little melodic fragments over certain chords and then figure out how to connect those fragments into an overall melody. The first idea I had was the melody that's over the first two chords of the song. The The second one was that fragment over the D and G chords. And that just sounds in my ear like a motif that Hisaishi likes to use a lot. Then on that same chord, I got this counter melody idea uh, for the left hand. And I think retrospectively, the reason I heard that was that there's a similar counter melody idea in Umi no Mieru Machi from Kiki's Delivery Service. I kind of hear that as being like in the summertime. I think that that melodic idea might be in some Phantom of the Opera song, but yeah, writing is complicated stealing in some ways. Then I got this melodic idea for a tagline on the last chord of the progression with that half step leading up. I don't think I really mimicked what it does from a theory perspective, but this was an idea from the tail end of the loop for A Ruby and Dance by New Jabez. And from there, all I can say is that I had these dots on the board and I tried to figure out how to melodically connect them. And that's how I wrote the melody. And the result was the final thing that we used in the song. So as we can see here, my approach to writing melodies is a lot less scientific and a lot less theoretical than my approach to the chords. I've always viewed melody as kind of the soul at the core of the music, uh, and because of that, the process of writing melody is much more one of spirit for me than a mental one like harmony is. Anyway, so that's the theory side of how I made the piano loop for this song. Be sure to go check out Gami's channel to find out what he did from a production and beat making standpoint so you can just get how to make stuff like this on your own. Anyway, I hope that was enjoyable for you and that you learned something cool today and that you make some cool music because of it. I look forward to hearing that music and to seeing you around my channel. But until next time, Jane.